I can't erase the, the, this memory. It just comes back right now. I can see the guy walking across the patio and Lamus walking beside him. And I don't think that the young man knew that they were going to shoot him. And then something happened. At that moment, a lady was dressed, uh, she was a military lady. She was dressed in green. She was about eight months pregnant. And she screamed out at that exact moment, shoot him in the face. In other words, she didn't want to see him just killed. She wanted to see him mutilated. She wanted to see him completely destroyed. And fired. They shot him. That was terrible. But then, with the audience applauding and screaming, the firing squad began dancing around the body, just like, just like savages. They were, they were completely, they'd gone completely mad, it seemed. They were really content with what they had done, as though they had conquered an enemy, as though they had really completed some fantastic task. Our conversation is with Mr. Tony Bryant, who was a former member of the Black Panther Party here in the United States, and he was imbued with an intense hatred of America. In 1969, Tony hijacked an American jetliner and took it to Cuba. His mission there was to contact Fidel Castro and secure arms for terrorism and revolution here in the United States. But much to his surprise, instead of being welcomed as a conquering hero, instead, he was thrown into prison, and for the next 12 years, he languished in Cuban jails. In 1980, he was released, and he came to the United States, and since that time, has been conducting a crusade to expose the reality of life under communism and the deceit of anti-American propaganda here in the United States. Tony, let's begin this by my asking you, what exactly is the Black Panther Party? The Black Panther Party is particularly, uh, specifically, a splinter group or a splinter organization, you could say, of international communism, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, all of the doctrines, all of the teachings that uh, were given to us definitely were communist, with a base of, basis of communism, and uh, in fact we studied from Mao Zedong's Red, Red Book, which uh, the only changes that were made in that in our, in our studies were the fact that we had to remove the word communism when we were uh, reading from the book or reciting and replace that word with Black Panther, which is to say that we were being constantly uh, uh, imbued with the same ideology, although we changed the name. But it definitely was a, a group of action, an action terrorist organization uh, with the um, ends of creating or fomenting disturbances, uh, assassinations, and uh, in the end to bring about the revolution in the United States of America. So there was no secret among those of you who were in it that it was closely aligned with international communism? No, there was no secret at all. There definitely was no secret at all. What motivated you in the first place to join this organization? There were many factors, I think, that motivated me. One was uh, that I was very angry. I'd been, uh, I had been in prison a couple of times, but it was during that time in prison that I really became interested in the Black Panthers because it seemed that they presented an answer, and it seemed that they gave the black community a sense of pride. And as, as in all the communist uh, front organizations, there are some truths, and the basics, basis are lies, and they utilize the truth to bring about their truth, which is the lie, you see. And it was a fact that they did, in fact, uh, give a sense of, of belonging to the black community, especially the black male youth, who was uh, uh, very angry, belligerent, and it gave a sense of uh, power. And they played up to those uh, feelings and on to, uh, to that belief. And I was, I was a perfect patsy, if you want to classify it as that, for a perfect candidate for the Black Panthers, or for any organization which would be uh, anti-white, anti-establishment, you see. And that's particularly why I joined the Black Panther Party, not because I had any 
uh, solid ideological concepts because I didn't have. Everything that I did at that time was based on a feeling of dislike, hatred, you see. Definitely. Well, what kind of experiences did you have inside the party? Well, inside the party, I was... Um, my experiences were somewhat limited to a degree. I was um, assigned to one specific purpose, and that was to eliminate anyone that had infiltrated into the party, uh, such as uh, any agent that uh, I was told that that's an agent, that he must be eliminated, and that was my, that was my job, <coughs> to eliminate them. In the party itself, uh, the people are, are constantly indoctrinated, uh, Excuse me, Ma dare I ask how you would eliminate someone from the party? It didn't matter. Shoot them. Uh, kill them. Eliminate them. Did you ever do that? Thank God I haven't. But you would have been expected to? I would have done it, without a doubt. I would have done it and, not, and I would have considered myself justified in doing so. Because that was, uh, as far as I was concerned, my enemy. They had come to stop us from uh, bringing about the revolution. They had come to uh, inform, give away our secrets, uh, inform to Whitey particularly, and therefore they had to be killed. As far as I was, I was concerned, <coughs> I would have killed them, definitely. Well, why did you hijack an airplane? That's an interesting question. A lot of people ask that. At that time, the, the group that I was working with, I was in Sacramento at that time, working out with the Black Panther, working with the Black Panthers in Sacramento. And we decided that uh, that was the most uh, attractive, it was the most spectacular. And uh, also the fact that, Q that hijackers were being actually welcomed in Cuba with open arms as being the true revolutionaries. It created this, what we considered a true revolutionary atmosphere besides the fact that it also would disturb the, uh, the, the system, naturally, uh, someone hijacking an airliner and uh, placing in danger all the people there on the plane. And uh, it was a show of bravado. And uh, it would have definitely given me uh, the aura of a true revolutionary, one who was dedicated and who was prepared to do anything for the revolution, which I was at that time, you see. Uh, I must state, though, at that time that I did rob the passengers on the plane. But there's one, something I must point out also. The man that, uh, one of the people that I robbed on the plane, as strange as it may seem, uh, at least in Cuba, they said that this man was a revolutionary and the amount of money, that he was carrying a large amount of money, and uh, that my actions might have brought, or did bring about uh, uh, an observation or surveillance of that person which caused a breakdown in a very important cell here. And therefore I must have been working with, this, with the FBI or someone or some imperialist power. Wait, let's back over this again. Yes. There were, the, one of the persons that you took money from on the plane turned out to be a, you said a revolutionary, a communist, meaning, communist agent. A communist agent. Who Cuban communist accidentally agent. happened to be on that plane. Accidentally happened to be on Not that headed for Cuba, but headed for, for, Miami, for Miami. Miami. New York to Miami. So you hit this guy accidentally, yes. took his money, and that yes. put him in the spotlight. Yes. And that, okay, because he was so carrying he was a large amount of money. And uh, so they accused me then of being a CIA agent, or at least an uh, agent of imperialist powers, and uh, sentenced me to 12 years in prison. Well, let's talk about your prison experience. What was that like? That was horrendous. That was uh, a nightmare. The... Uh, I could go, I could talk for hours about that situation. The conditions were horrible. All the guards carried machetes or uh, bayonets. And the first, in fact, the first assassination that I saw was approximately two months after I had arrived there. One prisoner was, we just returned from lunch, and uh, the prisoner ran up to one of the cell windows to get a, a little bit of tobacco to make a sick roll a cigarette. And the guard uh, ran up and began beating him with a machete. And the prisoner whirled around and tried to grab the machete so that the guard wouldn't, couldn't hit him anymore. So the guard just stepped back to his under his shirt, pulled out a gun and shot him twice. And, and it was approximately 10 feet in front of me. And that really, it shocked me uh, 
because I had never witnessed anything that that brutal. Just uh, even though my past had been very brutal, but I had never witnessed the authorities, uh, those in a position of authority, being uh, so outwardly brutal. And that was really nothing. I came to find out later that that was really nothing. Uh, later on, the experiences that I had uh, were countless, but uh, things that were fantastic. I witnessed uh, executions, which I think I'm probably the only uh, American that has witnessed executions in Cuba. Uh, this was a particularly chilling thing. Three prisoners attempted to escape, and in the attempt, they killed three guards. And I was, I'm of course that they should have been punished and even pay with their life. It was the manner in which they were punished, you see, that uh, really began to make me think and began to make me uh, change some of my ideas. Because even up until that point, I have to point out that uh, I still believed in the revolution. I still believed that uh, that communism was the answer, that revolution was the definitely the answer, especially for the black people. Um, in this particular execution, since they had escaped from Principe, these three men, they brought them back and uh, they tried them right there in the, in the prison, in a little small room right in front of the, the galley in which I lived. And there was a large patio right in front where I, I could stand and look right out of the, the barred window, right into the patio, approximately five feet away. And uh, the first man, they captured him that same evening, <coughs> that same morning rather, uh, about one o'clock that morning. About five o'clock, I saw the guards running around putting up loudspeakers and all that. And then the judges came and then uh, they locked all the prisoners down, naturally. And then they began filling the prison up with uh, communists and uh, with uh, military uh, personnel from the streets until they had about two or 3,000 people there. And these were all dignitaries, or were they public at large? Or no, no, not public at large. In the no, not this time. They were all either members of the military, of G2, most of the time they did the whole public executions. This one was just military and uh, dignitaries. And uh, the first man they tried about seven or eight o'clock that morning. They caught him at one and they tried him about seven. And in the tr transcourse of the trial, the people who were in the courtroom began uh, shouting, firing squad, firing squad, firing squad. And about that time, a truck rolled into the patio, and I saw the guards begin to throw down sacks, sacks filled with sand. I still didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't even imagine that uh, the man was going to be executed. And a friend of mine who was standing beside me collapsed. And I, I finally found out that at least a couple of people told me that they're going to execute this man right now. I, I couldn't conceive of that because it just didn't make sense. It, all of the, the all of the uh, out of all the judicial processes that I had faced here, at least I had had the right to uh, uh, an attorney, the right to uh, appeal, and all that I'd ever heard of had been that even if, uh, the most atrocious murders I had the right to uh, an appeal here in the United States. Well, they marched him out. Colonel Lamus, who was now a colonel, who was then at that time a lieutenant, who was head of the head of all of the prisons in Cuba, marched him out. I can't I can't erase the the this memory. It just comes back right now. I can see the guy walking across the patio, and Lamus walking beside him. And I don't think that the young man knew that they were going to shoot him. But suddenly Lamus grabs him and pushes him against the, the bags. And then he knew, he understood what was going to happen. His hands were tied in front of him. And at that moment, the firing squad marched out from behind the same entrance that the truck had come in, through the same gates. And that was a horrifying sight. They marched to approximately 10 feet in front of the man. It was, it was not an execution, it was uh, an assassination, uh, uh, a way of 
satiating the, the lust that they had for blood. At any rate, uh, Lamus called out the ardor, ready, aim, and then something happened. At that moment, a lady was dressed, uh, she was a military lady, she was dressed in green. She was about eight months pregnant, and she screamed out at that exact moment, shoot him in the face. In other words, she didn't want to see him just killed. She wanted to see him mutilated. She wanted to see him completely destroyed. And fired. They shot him. His body was blown away from the sacks. And Lamus walked over to him, placed his gun behind the guy's head, gave him the coup de grace, then kicked him in the face and walked away. That was terrible. But then, with the audience applauding and screaming, the firing squad began dancing around the body, just like, just like savages. They were, they were completely, they'd gone completely mad, it seemed. They were really content with what they had done, as though they had conquered an enemy, as though they had really completed some fantastic task. And when they tired of dancing, they took the body and threw it into the back of a truck, and it left. The next day, they captured the other two, it was a repeat performance, the same identical procedure, the same dancing around the bodies, the same uh, spitting on the corpse, throwing it into a truck and taking it away. But it was in another prison, because I, I was sent to about 10 different prisons, 10 different work camps, concentration camps, where conditions were probably even worse because the treatment was extremely harsh. Uh, this one prison that, uh, I don't know how they sent me there because it was an accident, I believe, just because perhaps I was black and I was with the Cuban population. And uh, they just grabbed a bunch of records and I happened to have be in, uh, among that group and in the middle of the night they put us on the cattle carts pulled by tractors. And we traveled to a, a prison called Awika, which is in Matanzas. This was probably, it is one of the most feared concentration camps in Cuba. Upon our arrival there about four o'clock in the morning, there were two lines of guards, approximately 60 guards, 30 on one side, 30 on the other, forming a gauntlet. And uh, all these things were really new to me. They, really, they, were, they were really surprising to me because I'd never witnessed anything like this before. But as they called each uh, prisoner, uh, he had to jump off of the cattle car, cart and run between those two lines of guards. In fact, when, you, when he called your, called your name, you began screaming, run, 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 run. And as you ran, the guards on both sides would beat you with machetes. That was just the opening. That was just your introduction into this prison. See, when you say beat you with machetes, now I picture a machete as a giant knife. That's exactly what knife. it is. They're beating you with a machete. They're That's cutting true. you badly. They it? try to hit you with, well, they don't try. They utilize a nose, and, and at a moment like that, they will use the flat side. Uh, they'll hold it so that they hit you with the flat side. It's just enough to mark you. It's like my back is marked uh, with machetes. Uh, but it's not to really uh, disable you. It's to hurt you, but not disable you, because they want you to work, you see. But it's to let you know that you have come to a place where they will kill you. And they let you know that from the beginning by beating you into the place, letting you know. And that's for nothing, for doing nothing. All that is to instill terror, to uh, make you very uh, submissive, subservient, so that you will not uh, even attempt to, to do anything except what they tell you to do. They tell you to jump, you jump. They tell you to run, you run. They tell you to work, you work. If not, you know that you have waiting for you beatings by those people. And it was, I think, at that point that I began to really uh, question the revolution and question their motives. And I said, and this was almost three years after my imprisonment, after having seen many abuses, after having seen assassinations, after having seen uh, beatings and hunger and starvation, and yet I was so convinced that communism, that the revolution was necessary, that that didn't really bother me at all at the, up to that point. But something snapped 
and uh, I just began to try to analyze, I tried to analyze a little bit more what was going on around me. The next situation I think that really made me begin to open my eyes, this was in the same prison. We arrived at the camp about six o'clock that evening. We had a little uh, skimpy dinner with rice and fish and everyone just collapsed in bed. And about uh, one o'clock that morning, they just kicked the doors open, the guards, and they came in with dogs on a leash and uh, attacking the prisoners, sticking the dogs on the prisoners and just beating them. Just beat them out into the field and just had us stand there for about two or three hours. That's just terror tactics, terror. You see, Lenin said that uh, the best revolutionary is a rehabilitated prisoner, which is to say that anyone that they send through that mill, they'll come out what they want you to be. You will come out of there obedient, you'll come out of there a true revolutionary. In their sense of a revolutionary, a true revolutionary, whatever they tell you to do, you'll do it after you go through that. That's why prisons are so necessary in all communist countries. That's why they're so necessary in Cuba. That's why there, at one point there were over 500,000 prisoners, and this was while I was there in Cuba, with a population of 10 million people, not even 10 million at that time, 9 million people, 500,000 were prisoners. I myself, I probably weighed about 120, 115 pounds uh, during that time because there was no food, very little food. And finally, I just began fighting back. I began fighting with the guards, and they would beat me. It's a wonder you weren't killed. It's a wonder because they, while my head, I've been, my, my head has been fractured. Um, all these just cuts and scars, just from being chained 24 hours a day. Scars here with machetes. That's also a brick that a guard hit me in the head with. This is another scar from a machete. Just, uh, but the thing is, it wasn't, uh, a lot of people might accuse me of being bitter because of what happened to me, and I, I, I don't feel that at all. I'm not bitter at all about what happened to me. In fact, I'm very glad that it happened to me. If I'm bitter at all, it's about, it's about the things that I saw happen to other people, how I saw them destroying the, the human being, the human aspiration, the, the, all the desires completely uh, suffocating of the individual where he's not able to think, he's not able to, to uh, speak, he's uh, no longer able to create. They suffocate all of those ideas, all of those concepts. You can't write, you can't, you can't, you better not speak. Well, are you talking about life in prison now? Or yes. are you talking this, about life outside of prison? Well, this was particularly life in prison, although I did have an opportunity to witness life uh, outside the prison because I escaped from a prison which they classified as escape proof. And I was the first, I'm the first person to ever escape from this prison. And, and, for, and even at that point, I was in the uh, maximum security section because I had escaped from another prison prior to that, and so they caught me, and they put me in this prison before I was able to get to the street. Well, how did you get out? How this, did you escape? This time, I escaped from there. A friend of mine gave me a little piece of hacksaw blade that uh, he'd gotten into the prison somehow. I'll never know how. <clears throat> and uh, a friend and myself, we were locked in the cell 24 hours a day. It's on the second floor. And uh, this was in a prison called Wana Height. And we took the, the little piece of hacksaw blade and we began cutting. It took us 17 hours, 17, 18 hours to cut through, make one slice and one bar, and about approximately the same amount of time for the other bar. And uh, then we bent the bars. And that was about seven or eight hours work right there. It was fantastic. Anyway, we went up on the roof. I pulled myself up on the roof, and there are lights all over. The I was supposed, to, I'm supposed to be dead now. There's no one that's supposed to escape from this prison because the way that the uh, towers are situated, they can see any point in the prison, uh, anyone that's moving on any point, plus all over the roofs, because the roofs are painted white, and they have these giant lights going over the roofs, so they can see anyone moving up there. There's barbed wire up there and uh, glass, the whole thing. And yet, we 
we managed to make it up there over the top of the roof. I could see guards on the other side, on other roofs with machine guns. And uh, we had a little rope that we had made, my friend and I. And we lowered ourselves, still inside the prison, right beside the, uh, the wall, right in front of a guard tower, a giant guard tower. And we had to cross a space of approximately eight feet where the guards patrolled between towers. And we had decided, well, we're going to uh, just die or escape. That was all. I was, I was determined to either escape or die. decided, well, we're going to uh, just die or escape. That was all. I was, I was determined to either escape or die. This place, it was, it's bathed in light. It was just like daylight. And that's why I know, that's when I began to believe in God. I must stipulate that. Because it was this point, this particular escape, that uh, I don't know, <clears throat> I don't know to this day how that happened. We were lying we come down the, the rope and we were lying on the beside the building and just at the moment that we started to crawl we just crawled out onto the path and we heard footsteps coming two guards were coming from the opposite direction walking directly towards us and my friend told me well it's all over we're captured and uh they walked approximately two feet away from my head, I could have reached out and grabbed his leg, and they didn't even see us. It was just as though we'd become invisible. This was in the darkness? No, this was in plain, bright, just as bright as these lights are, because that place is bathed in light. You can't get out there without them seeing you. That's why I said, I, that's when I began to believe that God was doing something with my life. We crawled across, we're still inside the prison. To get out, there's still a white wall, about an eight foot high white wall, and then uh, above that, a fence, a barbed wire fence, with roll barbed wire over the top. We still have to go over that. We still have to go about uh, three blocks inside the prison, crawling along this wall, which is white, with lights bathed against it, so that any movement against it can be seen. The guards are, are in front, and the wall is here, and we began to crawl. And we crawled all the way, to, well, we crawled about halfway, and the escape was discovered in the building. In fact, we were right alongside the guard shack when uh, the sirens went off. And the guards came running out, and they started running towards the building. There was nothing for us to do except stand up and start running the other way. And we practically passed each other. <coughs> we were running this way, and the guards were running that way. And we finally made it to the end of the, the uh, wall. I helped him up. He got up to the top of the, uh, the white wall, and he helped to pull me up, and we escaped. And that just, as they say now, blew my mind, <laughs> really. So then, that was a beautiful morning when, I, when we made it out. We managed to get a cab. We didn't have any money. An old taxi cab, we, the guy was going to, he took us to Havana. Did he know you were escapees? No, 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 because we had taken our pants and turned them inside out, and our shirts, the, the, the stripe that they had, we ripped that off. And, and since most of the people in Cuba, they didn't have clothes at that time anyway, the same clothes that we had on were practically the same that they wore in the streets, blue jeans or something, Levi, like that, and that's exactly what we had. So we, went, we, didn't, we weren't really that noticeable when we arrived in Havana. Luckily, Upon arriving approximately four or five blocks from where this guy lived, he sees a lady that he knew when he was a little kid, because he'd been in prison then about seven or eight years. And he stopped the cab, jumped out, and she ran into her house and came back out with enough pencils to pay for the trip. This is all, this, I can just see the power of God working there, because if not, we'd have had to run, the police would have been called, and we'd have been captured much sooner than we were. But the cab driver was paid off, and we managed to just get away clean. 
And uh, so this friend of mine took me over to his grandmother's house, where she lived, and I stayed the night there. I still hadn't really seen anything of the community, but the next day I did, because uh, we had to leave. We couldn't stay there any longer. We had we we had this we, that night prior we had sneaked in because it was uh, to be seen going into a house and remaining overnight was to have the police called. I didn't know that. But that morning we left, and as we're walking down the street, uh, I noticed all these houses on every block. They had a house with a large sign hanging out in front that said CDR, Committee for the Defense of the Revolution. And I would see people standing out in front of the house watching everyone that walked by, or looking out of their windows and watching everyone that passed. And my friend told me, don't even slow down, just walk as though we're on our way to work or we're rushing somewhere. Because these people know everyone in the block. They know that we don't live in this block. This is, a, this is the strategy that's been set up to control, one of the strategies that's been set up to control the masses. On a square block in Cuba, there's one house on this side, another on this side, another on every side there's at least one house that is a committee for the defense of the revolution. In other words, what we would call an informer. They inform on everyone in that block, anything that they do. If uh, someone comes into, and this is 24 hours a day, if someone comes into the block and goes into a house, let's say, to visit someone, they mark that and they take note. If that person doesn't come out, within a few hours, they call the police just for visiting. You cannot go into a house in Cuba and stay as long as you want. Even if you're invited, you will be arrested. This is the control that's exercised over the people. Those committee members are the first that will be, there's no, they know that they will be uh, killed if the revolution is overthrown. They're the ones who, who have really, they probably have no ideology other than the fact that they want a little bit more to eat. They like the power that they exercise over the people the terror, the fear that people have for them. I felt that same fear that day because block after block after block, everyone was watching me. Aldous Huxley's prophetic vision is true. Big Brother is watching you every moment in those communist countries, every second. And it's a terrifying feeling when you know that you have no privacy, that your life does not belong to you anymore, that it belongs to the state, that any time they can take it. And that's from having that power that we have as a free country, as in the free individuals, the freedom to, to disappear if we feel like it, that no longer belongs to us when we allow communism to take over our country, or allow communism to come into our country and become the reigning factor. Because it's necessary for them that they control you completely. The surveillance is absolute. That feeling, as I said before, it's, it's, it's something that's horrendous. You can't imagine being stripped block after block that you walk, stripped. Everyone watching you. These people watching to make sure, to see if you go into a house. When you leave this block, then they forget you because they know you've been picked up on the next block. And they watch you. That was uh, my first lesson in the socialist state on the streets. I said, this is not what I want. And I asked, is this what you want? Is this what we want here in the United States? Is this what we want? Is this the socialist state that we're struggling to, uh, to bring here? And I say, we, I'm talking about the communists, the revolutionaries. Is this what we want? That we can't even walk down the street in peace? That we can't even uh, visit a friend? But the control that they exercise in the streets, beside that control that we're talking about, that I was explaining then, is the control of the food, the control of the, the material necessities of an individual, of the population. And it's no accident that that occurs in all communist countries, that there's always hunger, that there's always misery, that there's always a necessity. I think people should ask themselves, why is it that in all the communist countries there's always hunger? It seems a little strange. It seems that maybe out of one, out of all the communist countries, maybe one should have an adequate amount of food for its citizens and uh, an adequate amount of clothing 
and enough heat to heat them during the winter, why is it that they are always hungry? Why is it that they're always dependent, always saying that they depend on the capitalist countries, mainly the United States, to support them and keep them alive and feed them? And I say that they really have the capacity to support themselves, that there is plenty of food, that they do not give it. They do not give the food to the population because it's necessary that they keep the people hungry. So first of all, they have no other idea, no other thought in mind except how to get that next bit of food. Keeps them unstable. They're not able to function. They don't even think about uh, another ideology or another philosophy or what. Uh, they're not thinking about any of that. They're thinking about how to give food to that child. How can I get food? And also it enables the, the uh, socialist countries to take all that excess food that they do have a tremendous amount sell it to other countries and buy weapons or trade it for weapons so they can suppress the masses even more. But it's necessary that they, that community, that people be kept hungry, in need, constantly, so that for, as a promise, as a, uh, let's say, a, a booster, a morale booster, they can say, okay, well now, if you snitch, if you inform, we'll give you an extra pound of rice per month. Or we'll allow you to buy a portable radio. And there's a very limited amount of things like that. And the people, for those little bits of life, they began to sell their souls. They become like that gentleman in the Bible who sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. Well, they do the same thing inevitably, finally, the uh, Pavlovian effect is created <clears throat> that they will do anything to avoid that terror and to gain the recompense of a little bit of food, uh, maybe an extra pair of pants, because they can only buy one pair of pants per year, and maybe a dress per year, and uh, that's all. Well, how did you wind up back in prison? You were captured out I was captured. I was captured after uh, three days in, this, in, uh, in freedom. And they sent me to another very um, tough prison, and about seven days later I escaped from there. And so they didn't like that. They, they chained me 24 hours a day after that, and uh, placed me in a cell which was practically inescapable. There was no way to escape from it. Their walls were, it was solid cement. The walls were approximately this thick. There were three holes, two, two holes in the back of the cell, which was for the air, for my air and for the light. The door was just solid steel, a little slot that they could push the food through, and a uh, cement bed, cement slab to sleep on, and that's all. And I was there one year and two months in solitary confinement for those escapes because they really didn't appreciate my escaping from this place that they had said was escape proof. How did you get out of prison? Well, uh, this was during the, uh, the period that the Iranian hostages were, uh, there was quite a, a problem here in the United States concerning the, the hostages in Iran. That was when they took over the embassy in, in Iran. And there was a lot of pressure on uh, Mr. Carter. And uh, since Carter, as far as I'm concerned, had done so many favors for Mr. Fidel Castro and been so so nice to him. They'd got along so well that um, Carter really, uh, Castro really didn't want to see Carter out of office. He was terrified of Reagan uh, gaining their presidency. And so to bolster his sagging image, Carter's sagging image, and since Carter couldn't get the Iranian hostages out in time for the elections, and this was all a factor in our political ploys, it was necessary then that they give something to Carter to make him look like he really was doing something. So. Castro, as a favorite Carter, decides to release the 33 Americans that are in, uh, that were being held in Cuba. But I always believed that I would escape. I always believed that. And uh, maybe it was because of that belief that, that God was doing something with my life that made me positive. And it made me very positive that they couldn't do anything with me. And I still believe that. I don't, I believe that I'm practically untouchable.
not because of me, but because of the power of God that surrounds me, that protects me. I don't believe they can do anything. That's why I will preach, teach, speak anywhere, and I have no fear. I have no fear of them. And that's a very important fact, I think. Communism is doomed to failure because of people like myself who do not fear them, who do believe in God, and know that God is the power, that they are liars. They are the liars. They are the sons of Satan. God is alive. God lives. That's the thing that makes me positive and makes me very sure that they are doomed to failure. Well, you're in the United States now, and you say you have no fear. You surely would know better than anyone how unpopular your message is in certain circles. So let's turn to the United States and take a look briefly at what you see here. Uh, earlier you were talking about ways of identifying those who are working knowingly or unknowingly to bring about communism in America. How can you identify such a person? Fine, I think that's a, that's a pertinent question. It, that's not too difficult to identify, though, at least for my, now for me it isn't, because of the fact that I recognize their slogans, their, 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 their ploys, the propaganda that they, they constantly come up with. But for the person that's unaware of uh, their tactics, they must first of all understand that anyone, any person, any organization that propagates superiority of racism, that white is no good, or that black is no good, or that white is the cause of all this, or that the, 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 the niggers are, uh, got to be killed. Anyone, that's one of the things, that's one of their basic tactics is to divide. And the way that they divide most of the time, talking about communism, communists, is through the, the, the problems of, of racial uh, differences, of uh, economic differences, class differences, if you want to classify it for the term they like to use, class differences. We don't need people like that. We don't need people who, to uh, try to brainwash us and make us hate each other, you see. And that's exactly, that, those are the phrases that they'll use that uh, basically, as far as the racial issue goes, that white is no good, black is no good. This is to keep us divided. Mm -hmm. They should be avoided. Those are communists. Those are uh, the ones that intend to divide us. Would you uh, apply this to the black and the white supremacist organizations? Definitely. What about organizations such as the uh, Ku Klux Klan, the States' Rights Party, uh, the neo-Nazis, and maybe this is unfair to lump them all together, I don't mean that, but these are groups which generally advocate rather uh, strong, if not violent, solutions to the problem. Yes, and uh, definitely, and I might include in that group uh, the, the black Israelites who are extremely dangerous. In Miami, they, in fact, just lately, they killed a couple of their followers for just wanting to leave. It's cut their heads off, decapitated them. A few of their followers, in fact. All of those organizations have been completely infiltrated by communists. They are I, I would go as far as to say that they are now manipulated and ran by international communism. And it only makes sense because if, uh, let's say, they want a situation created where the, the police have to uh, come on the scene, where the police have to intervene, and maybe where there are people who are hurt, that has, then a riot is provoked. Frankly, it's very simple. Get a Ku Klux Klansman. Have him burn a, a, a cross in a black person's lawn, or get one of the Ku Klux Klan cops, or which, whatever, and get them to commit any atrocity against a black. And naturally, the black people, who have also their provocateur, their Ashan provocateur here, begins to scream, Kill Whitey! Burn, baby, burn! And the next thing is, is there's a riot, which naturally brings repression which naturally brings beatings and all of that, that type of situation and brings, uh, causes people naturally to feel that the system is oppressive, that the system is trying to destroy them, especially in the black community because of the fact that we were slaves, the fact that there have been atrocities committed and those things have to be very clear that they are true. And those things that have happened, many times have happened in the past because of ignorance because of racial hatreds 
but now they're being utilized by the communists to completely destroy the black community, to completely divide the black community and not allow them to even have the opportunity of coming close to the other ethnic groups and trying to find out and work out our problems together, you see. Well, that suggests a problem perhaps in the black leadership. What, what is oh, your opinion of that? Definitely. Well, this, uh, the black leadership in the, that I've seen since I returned, uh, I've seen to be um, very liberal. Some, without a doubt, communist. Very well prepared, and they play their roles very, very well. And uh, that goes back to as far as the great savior, Martin Luther King, who I, myself, as an individual, I never liked. During the time that he was active, I didn't like him because of the fact that he was a pacifist. And I you was, wanted more action. And I was. I wanted. I wanted terror. At that time, I said, you want to see change? Put a 38 to a man's head and pull the trigger. You've got change. My ideology at that time was based on, as Mao Zedong said, political power comes from the barrel of a gun, and that was all I could understand. So I didn't like Martin Luther King at that time because I saw him as someone just leading our people out there to be beaten and stabbed and kicked in, in the tail. Later, after I discovered, I began to understand the workings of international communism and understood uh, how those situations are provoked and how his leadership provoked situations that created uh, intervention by police, governmental intervention on uh, the national level. Then I understood that he also was working directly for, with the communists, you see. I don't know if he was a card-carrying communist, I do know that the people that worked with him and around him were communists. And I have to use the old adage now, birds of a feather flock together. I won't work with a communist. So this man, who was very intelligent, much more so than I, and I, he was well aware of the people who worked with him, he was warned several times of, uh, of certain people who were communists in his organization, and yet he continued. So I would say that definitely he was well aware of who he was working with, and it didn't matter. I would classify him, if, if I'm correct in my assumptions and my assertions, I would, I would classify him as a traitor, just as I classify Angela Davis as a traitor. And because that woman, talking about her particularly, she's been to Cuba. She's seen the situation there. She knows what, what, what it's about. She's been to Russia. She knows of the racism that exists in Russia. She knows that black people in Russia can't, they can't move freely, nor can they live where they want to live, nor can they marry if they so desire a white Russian woman. If they do, they, must, they are taken out of the country. They cannot return, and she has to go with them. She knows that just as I know it, and yet she says nothing about that. In fact, she won't even discuss the problem of racism in Russia, the racism against the, the uh, the Mongolians, the racism against the the, uh, what's the other group I'm trying to think of the uh, ju uh, the Jews. No, oh well, that definitely the Jews. Definitely. Ethnic uh, discrimination. Uh, definitely, and she never discusses that. You mentioned ago that you a moment ago that you thought these people were in essence traitors. Yes. Uh, traitors to what? To humanity. I believe that they're traitors to humanity. That's why I classify them as diabolical. I believe that they have sold their souls, everything, to, uh, to Satan. They are just, they're diabolical. They definitely are. They, they've betrayed humanity, and knowingly. Some because they enjoy that, the power, some because they enjoy the blood, that they have a, bl a lust for blood. They have a lust for that absolute power. And that's why they do that. They've sold out their traitors. Definitely. Yes. Well, Mr. Bryant, we've covered a lot of material here. This has been extremely enlightening and kind of frightening. Yes, very. Uh, looking ahead, what do you see in the future for America? I see... I've said when I first returned that we're going to see more terrorist activities in the next few years than we probably ever have because of the fact that we have been prepared, the American 
public has been prepared for that through the media, through propaganda, and through laxity, just not just being too lax and not really interested in what's happening around us through the infiltrate through the infiltration and use of narcotics and dope that is brought into our communities that has completely destroyed the morals. I see a very, 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 very turbulent future. But I do see victory because I see God. As long as there is God and there will always be, I see victory. And that's the only thing I can say to the American people, to everyone, is everything else might, anything, every, anything might happen. But one thing, just keep saying, God exists. Communism is a lie.